Uh, how y'all doing? Uh, ooh, welcome to the Library of Congress National Book Festival. We've got a fun panel conversation for you today. It's come into my world, vivid people and places in fiction. I am the moderator for this afternoon. My name is B.A. Parker. I'm co-host of Code Switch on NPR. Um, first, I'd like to thank our sponsors. Um, what I love about the chat that we're about to have right now is that it dives into what it takes to build the fantastical. Um, please note that we'll have time, uh, like 15 minutes, uh, for a Q&A afterwards. So get your questions ready if you have them. And for those looking to get your book signed, there is a book signing at 3 p.m. So, all right. Um, <laughs> without further ado, please welcome Tochian Yabuchi and Leslie Penelope. Okay, so right out the gate, like, I'm going to ask about the inspiration for your latest novels, you know, Goliath and The Monsters We Defy. And so, Leslie, I think you have, like, the most millennial impetus for, like, an origin of writing The Monsters We Defy, and that it was, like, saw it on Twitter. <laughs> yes. I don't remember exactly when, but I, I saw a tweet like a manuscript wish list type of tweet that um, agents and editors often make to say what they're looking for. And it was a Harlem Renaissance fantasy heist. And I was like, hmm, that sounds interesting. I would read that. I think I could write that. Like I've never written a heist before. And it, it seemed like a huge challenge, but I had just gotten off a long series, uh, Earth Singer Chronicles, and, which was epic fantasy. And I wanted something different. And so a historical fantasy heist just sounded just up my alley. And yeah, I dove into the research and figured it out. Uh, so yeah, it, was, it is a millennial kind of thing to have happen, just inspired by a tweet. <laughs> <laughs> and so Tochi, what was your inspiration for the, to get into the world of Goliath? So, um, it's funny, I was actually, uh, in 2013, I was in Ramallah in the West Bank working with a prisoner's rights organization. Mm -hmm. And at the time I, had uh, this idea for this like mosaic novel of these people set on a space colony and it was going to be very literary. It was like Mad Men in space, right? But I was looking at it and like all the characters in there on the space colony were white or white coded. And I was like, wait a second, there are no black people on this space colony. Where did they go? <laughs> and I was like, oh, they got left behind. And you know, I, when I was in the West Bank, the, the Arabic word for Palestine is Philistine. And I grew up in a very biblically robust uh, household. And so I figured I knew about the Philistines and David and Goliath. And so I wrote this short story about this group of black and brown brick stackers in New Haven. Um, and then it sat on my hard drive, uh, unsold for a number of years. And then back in, I want to say, end of 2014, I returned to it because one of the things that happened when I first wrote that story was I knew immediately that it was the best thing that I'd ever written. Dang. Like, it was a level up. It was like freaking Rock Lee unlocking the gates during his fight with Gara during the Chunin exams. Like, it was ridiculous. I was like, yo, I went somewhere with this. And so I wanted, to, I wanted to tap back into that. I was like, okay, what was going on here that I like snapped so hard with this story? Um, and then I started writing more about the characters and it was, it was like the most vibes situation ever. Like normally I'm a planner, but I was just like, let's just see where this goes. And then Goliath just sort of came out of that. That's interesting because we talked about this briefly <laughs> backstage because I am curious with both of your writing regimens, are you more um, architectural in that you're building brick by brick, or are you more sculptural where like, you're carving out? Like, how is your process? We'll go with Leslie. <laughs> so Tochi said that it's spreadsheets versus vibes, and that was just so accurate, because I am a huge fan of spreadsheets. I'm a planner, I'm a plotter, everything I have to know in advance, which is not to say that it doesn't change as I write it, because it always does. Like, I have never plotted a book that it remained the same as when I plotted it. But I need to, to organize my mind in that way. So for this book, I first started with the research. Um, Harlem Renaissance, I, I was originally going to set the book in Harlem. 
I'd always been fascinated by Harlem Renaissance characters, and specifically Oscar Micheaux, who was uh, one of the first black filmmakers. He was an early filmmaker. Uh, I have a, my background is film production. I went to Howard University for film, and one of my inspirations for becoming an independent filmmaker was Oscar Micheaux. And you know, he made these movies very scrappily. He crowdfunded them, essentially. He was selling shares of a company in the, the 19-teens in order to, to fund this, you know, this movie, these movies he was making. He was also a, a writer. He's a writer first. And so I, I was researching Harlem Renaissance figures. And then I, but it was during the pandemic. So I started writing this in April of 2020, after, right after I turned in my last book. And so I couldn't travel, I couldn't go to New York, I couldn't even go to libraries during the, most of the, the research and the kind of the pre-production process of the novel. And I live in Maryland. Um, as I said, I went to Howard. My family's from DC. I, I grew up in Maryland for most of my life. And so I started researching DC and finding all of these amazing things that were happening that I hadn't realized were happening during that time period in DC, like Black Broadway, which is U Street. And I spent a lot of time on U Street in college and post-college, back before what it was now, when it was still nightclubs and you know, I was going to poetry readings and hip-hop shows and my friends were DJs and singers and you know, I was deep ensconced in the artistic you know, life of the city, which at that time and for the community that I was a part of was centered on U Street. And I was like, this has to be a DC story. I don't read enough fantasy books about DC. I don't know if I've ever read a fantasy book about DC, honestly. I'm sure there are some. But uh, I just wanted to add to the knowledge of this place that is my home. And there was so much going on. There were so many musicians and you know, nightclubs and art writers, artists of all kinds, that some of them ended up in the book. And I was learning about them and crafting a story that was uniquely DC and learning about the history of black people in DC and just how, you know, before, you know, in the late 1800s, DC had the, the largest population of black Americans, bigger than Harlem. And it wasn't, a shift happened later on, but there was so much going on here that I didn't think people knew enough about. And it was, a lot of it was very inspiring to me and the various characters that appear in the story. And so I did all the research and I did months of research as I was discovering characters. I knew I wanted to have a heist, so I needed you know, people to steal something. I needed to know what they were stealing. I had no idea. Um, who was the bad guy? Who they were stealing it from? Like, I had nothing but Harlem Renaissance era you know, fantasy heist. So all of those things, all of the plot details came about through research and just you know, the brainstorming process and eventually following different plotting systems, filling out my 10 spreadsheet, 10 sheet spreadsheets with- 10 sheets. 10, there's various, there's plot existence, there's character development things, there's, um, I, I mean, I, I like to do multiple plotting systems and just compare them to each other. Oh, those tabs are wild. The tabs are wild. It's intense, oh. it's intense. Like the whole vibes thing, I'm really jealous. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to do it on vibes. But uh, yeah, it's intense. And then there's note cards and there's, you know, handwritten notes and um, computer notes and then like various writing devices. I like gadgets also. So like various typing machines that only show you four, character, four lines of text so you can't edit. And it, I, I'll stop. <laughs> Oh, it's like, like, it's like a serial killer wall? Yes! <laughs> it's like a virtual serial killer wall, yes. I That's what my mind looks like. I respect that. <laughs> it's like Charlie Day pointing at you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's my process. But the, I can the do touchy, it. How, how did yours go? Oh, man, it's, it's like, you know, it's, it's funny because I think I realized, because I think a lot about process, and I think I've arrived at the place that I've arrived at, in part because I've internalized so much of the, you know, rules, quote unquote, of writing, um, and just the way that I put sentences together, and character progression, and plot, and like rising action, and denouement, and all that stuff, right? Like, it's all just in my bones at this point, so now I can just sort of play jazz with it. And oftentimes, like, I'll, an idea will sit in my head for a very long time, and that's often when a lot of the research is happening. Like, I'm researching my next idea while I'm writing something else, and then the first line will come into my head. And as soon as that happens, I, like, have to write it, because at that point, it's like the dam's going to burst. Mm. If I, like, don't write it, it's like, okay, Toji, like, what's, 
what's going on? You're hurting yourself. Just like write this sentence. And so once I write that sentence, the rest of the scene comes. And once I have that beginning of the story, then the rest just goes. And it's almost like all the stuff that had been growing in my head starts to sprout. And so that, I think, is part of what my process is here. Goliath was weird because it was, in many ways, the it was almost like the terminus of that process. Goliath was the very first book that I wrote, or at least that I drafted, out of order. Um, although Riot Baby, maybe, because in Riot Baby, the South Central chapter, I guess, which is the very first section of the book, was actually the last part that I wrote. Um, but with Riot Baby, I more or less kind of sort of knew what I was doing. Goliath, I had no idea what I was doing. So like, you know, the, the, the part that's, the part that's, I think, summer, the first scenes were there, but also there were chunks of it that wound up in the fall chapter, the fall section of the book. And then there was spring and winter was like the last section, but there were parts of winter that dated back to like 2012. And like, it was just, I was, I had no idea what I was doing, but like it all seemed to work and to fit together. And I think it was one of those things too where sometimes in improv, you'll make what you know may seem in another sense like a mistake. Or like you'll hear somebody on stage and they'll they'll be you know doing their riffs they'll be doing their solo or whatever and you'll hear them make a mistake but really they turn it into like a key change and it becomes like the beginning of a whole new beautiful part of the guitar solo right so like that's what a lot of it fe it felt like i couldn't make a mistake because everything was useful and yeah just like vibes <laughs> <laughs> well it's also what's great about that is within the context of like the fantasy genre, there is kind of this um, liberation or this whimsy that comes with the creative process. But even in your works, there's still like the, like the weight of black reality is still there. And so I am curious about what draws you to that because it could be like, you know, a universe that, has no colonialism, has no racism, homophobia, sexism, but like, but that's not how it goes even in the fantasy. Yeah, I, I do, I always am writing about black people, even in a secondary fantasy world. Um, I like to have my default be black. So often you hear about the white default in literature mm -hmm. and you're assuming a character is white unless you're told otherwise. In my books, just assume a character is black unless I tell you otherwise. And so, you could, and maybe in the future I will explore like worlds where there aren't the conflicts that we have now, but I do believe that on some level you need some kind of conflict. And because fantasy and speculative fiction in general is a good mirror to hold up to our world, you know, I, I love it because you can reflect some of the problems that we have in different ways without the baggage that we carry and hopefully get people to look at them in a different way and maybe see them from, through a different lens. And so I do, you know, in all of my work, deal with some of the same issues and reflect them through a different lens so that people can have, you know, create a little bit more empathy about certain situations that if I told you exactly, it was a straight line between what's happening now and what I'm writing about, as opposed to bending it and waving it and then surprising you with it maybe, or just having you think about it differently. Uh, you know, I, it just make, it's more meaningful for me to do that. So, but even in The Monsters We Defy, takes place in 1925, Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. It's not about racial conflict. You know, it's about a thriving black community in D.C. It's about, you know, this place that existed that was real where you could live your whole life shopping at black businesses and, you know, only working for black employers mm -hmm. and things like that. So the, the, um, the larger environment of 1925, America, is there. But the villains aren't white people and the villains aren't racism necessarily. And it's really just a very black story. And I thought that, you know, we need that too. We need to see our, our people thriving and even in the past, because that gets overshadowed a lot of times. You know, when you think of, I think of 1925 at first, and I was like, how am I gonna write this story without it being about black pain? You know, because I just think of, you know, the rise of the Klan and lynchings and all these other things that were happening at that time. And I didn't want to write about that. 
Uh, so I know I found a way to still tell the story, still tell about these lives that are impacted by all of those things that are happening, but people who actually in real life managed to have wonderfully rich lives that were full and happy and self, you know, just in control of themselves and in control of their environments to the degree that they could, and add that magical element to it, which um, just is something that I'm always interested in writing about magic and something fantasy-like, that gives you another, another dimension to that where it's, it's based, the magic in the book is kind of based in black folk magic, in you know, hoodoo and root work and conjure and things like that, and then my own take on that, and just through the filter of my imagination, trying to bring that to life too. So it's all about our culture and just celebrating it, um, and just telling a new story that hasn't been told about that. Yeah, like I, you know, I, really, I really vibed with, uh, <laughs> what you were saying about news stories, because I think one of the biggest um, sort of breakthroughs in particularly in science fiction and fantasy over the past, I don't know, I guess you could say like 20 years, 15, 20 years is, you know, because sometimes there'll be these like trends where everybody's writing about AI and then everybody's writing about like Mars and then everybody's writing about like this, that, and the third, right? Um, but the biggest thing is less now the, the like subject matter and more the people who are writing. Like that seems to be the biggest thing where now we have more uh, you know, people of different genders. We have non-binary authors writing and publishing more in traditional outlets in science fiction and fantasy, more people of uh, diverse backgrounds. We have more people of Asian, East Asian backgrounds, South Asian backgrounds, African backgrounds, et cetera. And one of, the, one of the interesting ways in which that intersects with genre is that science fiction in particular is very colonialist in origin, like immensely colonialist. Like you think of all those first contact stories, um, a lot of them are it's like white dudes going to a place where there are already people or things um, and then just making it their own. Like that's what all those like settling on Mars and terraforming Mars stuff is. It's literally like, Columbus and genocide, like, and you're the hero, right? Um, but what's interesting now is that now you're seeing this genre space being not like taken over, but being filled now by the children and grandchildren of empire. Like, my grandparents were British colonial subjects, right? So, like, I have a, I would have a very different perspective on what science fiction and fantasy can mean to me versus like, you know, somebody descended from like the colonial overseers and what have you. So I think that's a big part of where a lot of my perspective on science fiction uh, comes from. At the same time, it can be a very tough space to live in when writing or when sort of analog analogizing the black experience in these spaces. It's, it reminds me of, um, I think it was a piece that Gene Demby wrote like back in 2015 about black reporters covering um, you know, black death or a lot of what was happening in America with regards to the officer involved shootings and whatnot because now you have, you have people that are performing this professional duty of documentation but at the same time the people that they're reporting on are people that look like their cousins, that look like their moms and their dads and their brothers and their sisters and they quite literally have skin in the game and there's something that that, that does to you. And I feel like similarly, like Goliath was not like an easy book to write. Like it came out of me relatively quickly, but it wasn't an easy space to live in because I was also writing about the place that I lived in at the time and like still live in. Yeah. And I was like, oh yeah, what if like nuclear fallout and like these places that I love are just gone or like, and so, you know, I, I do think at one point I would like to write about a place where there's like no colonialism. <laughs> like that'd be really cool, but it, it, the thing about it is that it would also be a wild and maybe the wildest stretch of my imagination. <laughs> like, cause I don't, I have no idea what that would look like. It's easier for me to en envision what the world in 2050 after climate change and nuclear fallout would look like than it is for me to envision like, okay, what could, what could a world without colonialism look like? Well, geez, touch. <laughs> <laughs> This is an incredibly naive question on my part, but it is as someone like from the outside. Like I was never, I was never a sci-fi kid. 
I, but I was obsessed with the Twilight Zone, so I've seen like every Twilight Zone like 15 times over. Uh, but there was also like there was also, like a lesson to it though. There was always like you know the shelter was people are, will still suck even when times are bad, like all that kind of stuff. But I am curious. It seems like the fantastical stories that bubble up into the zeitgeist seem to be like, you know, the dystopic or the post-apocalyptic. And why is it, I guess you've answered this a little bit, but like why is it so easy to lean into the dystopic? Like why is it never like this Wakandian world where, you know, People recycled, and it's 2080, and you know, women and people and non-binary folks are all together, and it's wonderful. Like, why is it never that that becomes the discussion? Like, there are, I mean, the girls on the subway have been reading *Parable of the Sour* like mad right now, and so like, why is it we like we lean towards the dystopic? Well, I mean, it's it's sort of like the same reason why people like. Ruth Wilson Gilmore and Mariam Kaba are so rare, right? Like, I think it takes a certain imagination. Like, I see this a lot in activist circles. Like, it takes a certain, um, like, there's something that allows for certain people to expand their moral imagination in a way that, like, isn't accessible to, like, me, for instance. Like, I have to go to them. I have to go to others like them for that sort of thing. Like, I just can't think that way, but there are people that are able to manifest that sort of vision that power their mission so they can be like, okay, this is what it can look like in a like prison abolitionist world. Or like, this is what the world can look like if, if, you know, police, if the funds that go towards police departments were allocated towards social services and schools and this, that, and the third. You know, this is what it can look like when we have a green revolution. And this is what it can look like when we have a coalition between people who are advocating for sustainability and people who are advocating for prison reform. Like, I think it's, it's, it's partly that. Like, if we look to activist circles and see how rare a lot of those people are, particularly the ones that are, like, doing the work and whatnot, I think that can help us answer the question of why it's so easy to imagine the end of the world as opposed to like the beginning of something new and beautiful. But at the same time, I do think part of the answer lies in like what, you, what you've done with the monsters we defy and what like telling, I don't know, like a, a fantasy high story in an all black world, like I don't know, there's just like- it's Wonderful. There, yeah, there's something like salvational about that. Like I, I think it's, I don't know, it's just really cool. And I do think that it's cyclical. I think we're been, we've been dealing with the fallout of 2008, you know, in terms of art. Art responds to the times. So hip hop was created in the late 70s, in, in the 80s, you know, during that recession. And so you have this kind of protest music that comes up. And, it, and we've been dealing with the after effects of the financial crash of 2008, which has never quite resolved, and moving into other, like a new recession and pandemic. And, you know, so it's been a long time that art has been responding to these like, catastrophic occurrences. And, but if you look back, I think that you'll see if, it, so there's other time periods where things aren't quite so catastrophic in the society when art has responded differently. So I think that part of it is just what we're, what we're used to in the past decade or so of this dystopian art because people were, if not hopeless, at least hope was, you know, took a big hit when you can't pay the bills and your student loans are crazy and there's no jobs. And we've, we've been going that, through that for a long time. And maybe, maybe there's not a period when it's ever been utopic, but there's, there's always ups and downs. And so if we, I can't think of anything off the top of my head, of course. But I think if you look back, then, then there are art that is responding to more hopeful times, more um, times when people have a little bit more prosperity than the dips that, we, that have been so you know, important or impactful recently, and that could be one of the answers also. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking because this is, now Leslie, this is, your, is this your first book that's written that's in like the quote unquote real world? Yes, it is. And <laughs> so like, I mean, how does that change your approach? Like you had like, is it the Earth Singer? Earth Singer Chronicles. You had the, those, the Earth Singer Chronicles, and now you've had like, your setting in this real place, does that, change your approach? And does that change how you address certain topics? It, it changed a lot, yeah. So Earthsinger Chronicles was a similar time period. It was like a 1920s-esque period of time in terms of technology, but a totally different world, second world fantasy. And when I decided to set it in this world, 
I wanted it to be as accurate as possible. And part of that is just me and the way that my mind works. Like if I was, I created a map of DC because I wanted to be able to walk down the street and during my research, I would plot things on the map so that I could imagine myself walking down the street and know what businesses I was passing and what places my characters would pass. And so, you know, there's real, real life characters like Langston Hughes is in the book, Carter G. Woodson is in the book, William Hansberry, he was a professor at Howard. There's real people real places, real businesses, real business owners, as much you know, real life history as I could put in, I did. And because I was learning so much and I wanted this to feel like the real world with just this layer of magic on top of it as opposed to some kind of alternate history or something like that. And it, it was just, it was another challenge, I think, for me to try to recreate this. And once I knew I wanted to put these real characters, these real life people who I admired or had read, you know, or had just studied in school, uh, for them to appear, then it was also because my main character is based on a real person also. Mm -hmm. That made a big difference to respecting that, that person who I'm fictionalizing and uh, in trying to create something that feels if not re like real, but has a certain verisimilitude to it so that it, it can just honor like real people and real ancestors, you know, thinking about, okay, if their descendants were to read this and be like, oh, that's my grandmother. You know, I just wanted to, to respect that. And so all of the research that I did, I tried to, you know, went, went into creating that, where I, I did a lot of research for my second world fantasy also, mm -hmm. just to make it more lifelike and, you know, in this world, like when, when would they have, um, like things like telegraphs or something like that that I wanted to put in. And I could fudge it because it's not our world. Vibes. Vibes. <laughs> There's always vibes involved, even with all of my like obsessive research and planning and stuff like that. But yeah, like I, I, I found that I enjoyed the research. I didn't think that I would. I'd shied away from it for, for a long time because I was like, oh, I don't want to do a historical. That's a lot of pressure. But I found that I really, I loved the research and I loved putting the real stuff in there. Gosh. And in, in terms of first, now I told you this is your first adult fiction novel with Goliath. I mean, your, your book, uh, Riot Baby, which is phenomenal. Um, I, found, I, I think I found, like, when reading YA, there is some level of moral or kind of like didactic thing that's streaming along through it. Do you feel, you don't, do you feel that onus when you're writing an adult fiction? I mean, I think for me, the primary difference between uh, writing YA and writing adult is more sort of stylistic than anything. Because, you know, it's certainly not, you know, with regards to content, because War Girls has all sorts of wild stuff happening. <laughs> like, there's, there's dismemberment, there's child soldiers, like all this stuff, right? Um, and it's for 16 year olds. Um, they get it. Yeah, no, they get it. And also, too, like, it's never as though I'm writing down to any audience when I'm writing YA. In fact, if anything, I'm writing up to them. Um, and so there, I can have this sort of, like, moral um, and emotional sophistication at work. But I think one of the things is that in Goliath, or, like, even in Riot Baby, I can have a one-page sentence about a prison rodeo and I dare you to find me the YA editor that would allow me to get away with a one-page sentence <laughs> about anything. And so it's like, it's like that. Like, there's stylistic stuff that I, that I tried to pull off in Goliath that I just wouldn't be able to, to make work in a YA book. It's sort of like, you know, with YA, YA is like playing basketball, right? Where the goal is to get the, the ball in the hoop. There are a number of ways you can do it. You can drive to the rim, you got the fadeaway jumper, you got the three ball, you can hit the corner. You know, if you're Steph Curry, you could shoot from the logo, all sorts of stuff. <laughs> but the goal is the same. Whereas for me, writing adult is more like being in the Summer X Games, where the goal is to pull off the most like, physically dangerous and stylistically daring trick possible. Like, that's how you get points. And so that, to me, is much more akin to my experience writing Goliath. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, so like I do think it's really, you really can have that same sort of, that moral sort of grayness or unclear, or ambiguity mm -hmm. in both sort of markets, or at least you can get away with it. But I do find that like, there are certain sen sentences that I, uh, I just would not be able to keep in a while. <laughs> no, too many subjunctive clauses. <laughs> I mean, teenage 
teachers like semicolons. It's okay. <laughs> they do. They do. <laughs> <laughs> but okay, I want to talk about ground rules because with like the Moshes We Defy, there's so much like you have to break down like the charm and the trick and how did you establish the ground rules and understand them for yourself in order to break them down for the reader? So it's sort of just creating a magic system. Uh, what's in the Monsters We Defy is a light version. Like I've had this fantasy series which had a much more involved magic system. And so I, I wanted to do a similar thing. I had to make the rules so that I understood them uh, so that I knew what could and couldn't be possible with the magic so that I knew what would be cheating. you know. Um, and some, some of that is upfront and some of that is going back and editing and realizing, oh, I cheated, so I have to go fix that and Wait, make it a rule. What's cheating? Well, cheating is something like uh, you, you, the reader didn't know that the magic could do this, and all of a sudden you're flying in on the hawks or whatever. Five. <laughs> That's five. <laughs> That's five. <laughs> well, it's like Brandon Sanderson has these rules of magic, and I'm going to butcher it, but one of the Brandon Sanderson laws is that you, you have the ability to solve a problem with magic in the proportion that the reader knew that you could solve that problem with magic. That's not exactly what he said, but like, someone correct me. Um, and so I, that for me feels right. You know, Sometimes if I read a fantasy book and all of a sudden they've come up with a solution out of nowhere that you didn't know was possible, you feel a little bit tricked. You know, And sometimes you can get away with that and sometimes you can't. But um, yeah, so in, in this book we have a charm and a trick. And so much of, I think magic all around the world kind of is always a cost. You know, There always has to be a cost. So these entities called the enigmas who are spirits who can give you a charm, which is a good magical power, but it comes with a trick, which is basically a bad magical power. And you know, most of the characters are, are dealing with that. And so, yeah, I just, I, I broke down for myself what the charms were, what the tricks were, what would be something that you would agree to, you know, you're faced with this deal, you're given this power that could potentially solve a problem that you're having. And whatever the trick is, maybe it doesn't sound so bad at the time, or you're like, you brush it off. You're like, oh, that's not gonna be a big deal. And it ends up ruining your life. And that's what these characters are faced with. So they might have really cool power, but the trick is never worth it. And that's, you see that a lot of times in various types of African folk magic, which is a little different all over the diaspora, but has a lot of similarities like that. It's like a monkey paw situation. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. It's like equivalent exchange. You know, you want to bring your dead mother back to life, but it's going to cost you your arm and your brother's corporeal form. <laughs> So. I mean, that's a good magic system, yeah, right? Exactly. That's a good magic system. Yeah. <laughs> At least it gives you a place to go story wise and exactly. character wise. Yeah. Because I, I've listened to your podcast, My Imaginary Friends, and I think I, you said that your midpoint is fixed. Like the middle of your story, you've got it, mm -hmm. and like the, the people and the story kind of moves around to fit, to fit that. Mm -hmm. How do you bend and stretch your characters? to fit that midpoint. So yeah, it's like there's certain fixed points in time, like Doctor Who, that I, I know. And, I, and when the idea comes to me, those, even if they're not conscious, like as I'm feeling my way through, I know that's a fixed point in time. So I have to hit it, and then I have to, if I know, I know the end, at the, you know, I always know basically what the end will be, even if it shifts a little. And I know the beginning, generally. So I've got at least three fixed points in time, which kind of correspond to three major plot points in various plotting systems. Um, and then I plot up to the midpoint, and that usually stays pretty much the same. Whatever I plot after the midpoint always changes, 100%. I've never written anything that I've plotted up to after the midpoint in any book I've ever written because I learn so much when I'm getting there. And so in terms of how the characters shift and change, it's like they, I write the first draft really, really fast, and I, that's when I learn who the characters are and what they're gonna do, and that first draft is terrible, and they make mistakes, and they, they do things that they wouldn't do, like that aren't in their character, to fit the plot that I thought I was writing. Mm -hmm. And then after that, it's like I fix it because I've gone through that process, and I'm like, oh no, that's not who they are. Either I shift their character, or their personality, or their backstory, or their wound, or something about them that makes them do what they do, because I've, I've learned about them. And so it's kind of like they're, they're like ghostly figures, the first draft, and then they, they get more flesh and bone with the subsequent revisions. Mm. And that allows them to shift kind of on their own almost. Like I'm not so woo-woo as I believe that the characters just come to my head and talk to me, which some authors experience. Maybe that's the vibes, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> they don't do that to me. Like I'm, I'm carving them out, but, some, but they will like, 
I try to push them in this direction, and I can't write the scene. And I can't write the scene until I was like, oh, they wouldn't do that. They're going to do this. And then I can write the scene, and it, and it starts coming together more. All right, because, OK, Mr. Vibes, you have, with Goliath, you have like this epic ensemble. And how, were you, how could you curate the cast of characters? Like, how did that work for you? So some of it was, was functional. Um, there were some characters that I could take certain places sort of geographically um, that I couldn't take others. Because as much as the book is a story of New Haven and a story of Connecticut, it's also a sort of story of America. And so each of the characters has their own particular backstory of where they came from during their sort of refugee trek across the country to New Haven. And so that was, that was really interesting to explore. And it was like, OK, I haven't seen this part of the country yet. Who can I give a tragic backstory to that involves this, this particular place? Um, and so, and then it just became a matter of smoothing a lot of that stuff out. But it was also a process of discovery for me because a character would talk a certain way. I'd be like, wait a second, that character is not from Connecticut, that character's from Atlanta. How do they wind up in New Haven, Connecticut? And then, like, then I get to write this, you know, this scene that, you know, this character is talking about this house party that he went to in Atlanta one time that turned into, like, that turned into a heist. <laughs> but like, it became this, like, I don't know. It was sort of like opening myself up process-wise, and you know, there's to the point where I would almost, um, before certain sessions, just like say a prayer where I would get out of, that I would get out of my own way. Because um, I think that was the big part of it was there, like the story had lived in my head for so long that a lot of it was there. I just didn't necessarily have access to it yet. Or I would overthink things and sort of that would result in building up a dam between me and where I was supposed to go or where the story wanted to go. Mm -hmm. And so if I could just get out of my own way, then you know, the vibes could proceed unabated. <laughs> But was, was there a character that felt like a linchpin and that oh, yeah. really got the story going for you? Oh, there were two in particular, um, Bishop and Sydney. Oh. Yeah, those two characters were very much like, uh, very much like lodestones for me in the process of putting together this book. Like, I knew very early on that Link was going to be a sort of uh, through line mm -hmm. for a lot of the book. Like, he was the he was the person around which a lot of stuff was going to happen and to which a lot of stuff was going to happen. But in terms of like the dynamism of the community, a lot of that in my head came from Bishop and came from Sydney. And both of those characters have very specific relationships and interactions with Link, and that's part of what drives the story forward the way that it, the way that it does. And so when I was able to figure out those characters, yo, then we were cooking with gas. Oh my <laughs> goodness. Like it was, so yeah, I think those characters in particular, once they clicked for me, mm -hmm. then you know, we were off to the races. Oh, because like, okay, Leslie, you, you say that Clara was already a kind of real person? Yes. So, but how did were you able, how was she able to fit in your mind to fit into this story? Yeah, because we don't know much about the real Clara Johnson. Mm -hmm. um, and in the author's note, I talk about how I discovered her. She was, she was a 17 year old girl in 1919 during the DC riots. And essentially, uh, during the riots, police officers burst into her house, into her bedroom and shot at her, she shot back. She actually killed a white detective mm. and went to jail for a year and a half. She was convicted of manslaughter. And then she got out of jail. Uh, they granted her a new trial and they allowed her to plead self-defense. And they knew, the district attorney knew that they weren't going to be able to convict because she had not been allowed to, to plead self-defense in the first trial. So at, at 19, she goes, she goes free. And I read that and I thought of Breonna Taylor and I thought of what this girl must have been like, like to have gone through that at such a young age and then imagining her six years later, and what, was, what would be the personality, what would be the, the effects, the costs of being in jail for a year and a half, of being convicted, of you know, taking a life, but also taking a white life, being threatened with all kinds of things as a result of that, um, being sort of a, a celebrity in the black community and maybe not wanting that. Mm -hmm. So I created Clara as this very ornery, very like disgruntled character who doesn't want to want any friends, doesn't want to accept uh, you know, any sort of kindness from anyone, doesn't trust anyone. There's a lot of betrayals in, in the real story of the real Clara Johnson. So I took the little bits that we know from history 
from this person and just imagined a life and, and tried to bring about this person who would have been colored by those experiences and what that might mean. And so, yeah, we don't know anything else after she gets out of jail. There's not much in history that I could find about her. So I took the, you know, took the bits, and who would also make you know, a good heroine? Um, sometimes when I'm creating new main characters, I try, I'm trying to write someone different than any of the other books. Mm -hmm. And so Claire is very different from any of my other heroines, and her personality is different. And, and as a result of you know, learning about that character and really just diving deep into her, it became a story about fam found family. And like, what, how is she going to change? You know, what are the things, how does she learn to trust people and, and rely on other people? Well, you have a heist and you kind of have to trust your partners to a certain degree. And that's part of the journey of all of the other characters too in relation to Clara, the main character. Wow, and now I'm thinking, because you've answered this a little bit, but what you keep trying to change, to get, create a different protagonist for each story, like what kind of, in like in your next story, what kind of protagonist, kind of world do you want to explore? This is for both of you, but I am. So I'm working on the next book now. Uh, the main character is also very much more loosely based on a real person from history. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so my very first books, the main character had my personality. You know, like I think the first book you write, it's not really autobiographical autobiographical, but cleaving very close to what I know. Mm -hmm. And so as I'm trying to grow with each book, I'm trying to expand that and stretch and make sure I'm just rounding out, you know, all kinds of characters. So yeah, the thing I'm working on now, totally different personality type, but um, I still want a good heroine that you can follow, you know, so she is a little bit meeker, but more sneaky and sly, and she's like a grown-up Harriet the Spy, but black in 1935. <laughs> I can dig it. Yeah. <laughs> What about you? Uh, I mean, things are kind of up in the air. There are two contenders for what the next thing is. I mean, I'm always trying to write not just a different book from what came before, but almost in many ways like the polar opposite. So like Riot Baby was very much defined by its constriction. It was very claustrophobic by design. Um, whereas Goliath, I, I wanted to achieve a more sort of um, emotional expansiveness, um, but also geographic expansiveness. Um, and then the next book, there are, again, there are two contenders, one of which I wanted to sort of blow up the form of the novel even more and like do some really weird structural uh, metatextual things. So that's possibly what the next thing is. Or uh, the next thing is going to be like something that's almost, and this might actually even be more of a challenge, just like a straightforward detective book. <laughs> <laughs> Single POV, just one protagonist trying to un unravel a conspiracy or a mystery or whatever. That actually might be the more challenging book to write. And so I might be gravitating towards that one. Just find your inner Walter Mosley and just like get it done. Exactly. <laughs> I just gotta I just gotta find that. Wait, how's the how, how's the outlining going for that? Is that vibes or is that so that, I actually, I've outlined the whole thing, I just gotta write it. Oh. But we'll see if the, if the vibe situation persists. Like, <laughs> it may just be a different book from what I've planned, so. Oh, I'm excited. <laughs> um, on that note, Leslie Tochi, thank you so much for talking to the panel. <laughs> um, uh, we now have time for any questions that the audience might have for the authors. If you have any, raise your hands. I don't know how this is working. Oh, <clears throat> uh, the person in red in the uh, Did you want us to come to the mic? Oh, come to the mic. Got two. <laughs> is that okay? That's fine. The light is in my face. I can't see a thing. <laughs> <laughs> but go ahead. What you got? Okay. Well, um, one thing I wanted to... Um, refer, you were talking about the dystopian, why do we gravitate toward the dystopian? And, okay, I'm an actress, all right. I always think it's because it's more dramatic. Even in Wakanda, we had to bring in Killmonger to destroy the utopian aesthetic of mm -hmm. Wakanda. And that was where the drama came from. And um, the other thing I wanted to say about um, your writing and your inspiration for um, the monsters we defy. 
there is a, there's so much going on. I also do film, right? So there's a lot of the race films. A lot of people don't know about race films at all, but they existed uh, from almost 19, 19, 1918 approximately to 1915 before things went over. And I really appreciate a lot of the race films that you're bringing in. And the only question I really wanted to ask was, what are your... What was your inspiration? What do you think was one of your first sci-fi fantasy inspirations? And which ones would you recommend that I, as a writer, read? Both well, of you. Sure. Well, when I first, uh, Virginia Hamilton had a series, Justice and Her Brothers, mm -hmm. which was one of the first sci-fi books, or tr it was a trilogy, that I read as, as a kid. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm writing this down. Okay. <laughs> I'm not even sure it's in print. Justice and her brothers. Yeah, that okay. was the series. Um, and then, you know, when I got older, I was reading a lot of Octavia Butler. Uh, if you have not read Octavia, that should be. Corrected. Say it again. Slowly. Octavia Butler is the oh, name yes, of the yes, author. Yes, she yes, writes. Yes, she course. was a black science fiction. Yeah, author. I know. Yeah, I, here I got. I just couldn't hear it oh, because I'm, I'm having a little bit of trouble hearing these days. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, um, very briefly for me, one of the biggest, um, so I read a lot of manga as, as a kid, and one of the biggest sort of sci-fi inspirations for me was Akira by Katsuhiro Otomo. Yeah. Um, it's like 2,000 pages of the most mind-blowing, just like, I, a city falls out of the sky. <laughs> like, that's, that's all I need to say. Um, in terms of what I would recommend, in terms of science fiction um, and whatnot, the Broken Earth Trilogy mm -hmm. by N.K. Jemisin. If you want to read, like, literally the pinnacle of the field right now, like, literally somebody writing at the top of not just their game, but, like, the game mm -hmm. in general, um, the Broken Earth Trilogy is, I think, the best place to go. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I wanted to piggyback off of what you said about writing that page long sentence and when you're writing adult fiction it seems like there's sort of a mean you have to hit in using enough rhetorical flourish but without going overboard and it seems like especially at shorter lengths you can really cause yourself problems by getting into sort of an 18 car pile up situation if you do too many of them I kind of got into that in that I tried to throw every formal thing I could do into it and I had people telling me you're trying too hard don't make this so complicated no one can understand it that's enough things for a novel so I'm wondering how do you thread that needle of um, you know doing enough to make it interesting and compelling but without sort of beating the audience over the head with, you know, here's the formal stuff, here's the interesting stuff, here's my intelligent writing. I mean, uh, vibes. Um, <laughs> no, but but more more elaborately, I think part of it is I want I want each scene to feel a certain way or to evoke a certain even just like physical reaction. Like there are certain scenes that I'll read in a book and they'll feel very sensual. Even though there's no like sensual content, con like, content in it, just the way the sentences go, the, the consonants, like all of that, it just like feels a certain way. Um, or there are other scenes that I read where I'll literally be out of breath by the end. And a lot of that is just like comma placement. A lot of that is, okay, does this sentence have like five words? Does the next sentence have like three words? And then is there like, an 18 word sentence right after that. Like, you know, you read something like A Brief History of Seven Killings by Marlon James, and it's just chock full of rhetor rhetorical flourishes. Like, there's stream of consciousness, like no man's business, but so much of it is deliberate and intentional. And I think, I think that's part of how I think about it, is what do I want each scene to accomplish? Um, not just in terms of character choreography and plot, but how do I want a reader to feel leaving, leaving this scene? And that oftentimes, you know, forces me to, again, get out of my own way. Because, like, I don't, I don't have anything to prove to anybody in terms of, like, how smart a writer I am. Like, I just, I know, right? So, like, I don't need to show off for the sake of showing off. And so I think also, too, like, having that confidence, just knowing that you're a dope writer, <laughs> like, that takes you places. So, so, yeah, I hope that answers your question. I, only thing I would add is that you know sometimes some writers write for their books to be like savored over days or weeks. I really want my book to be read. I want to keep you up all night, 
And so that, that goes into the choices I make, you know, sentence-wise, you're talking about pacing, pacing-wise, speeding things up at a certain point in time, and giving you a break, all that stuff goes into it. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Um, I think both of you have mentioned kind of how you've interspersed different types of, like, religious stories or even your own experiences into your writing. And I'd love to hear a little bit more about kind of how you approach that, especially with some really tough topics that you're talking about. Ooh, I mean, I, I discovered at one point very early on in my 20s that my writing was at its best when I wrote directly into my fears. Mm -hmm. And so if I figured out what I was most afraid of at a particular time and then just wrote right into that, oftentimes like the thing that would come out <clears throat> would be the best thing that I had ever written. And I'm not quite sure why that is or how that happens. There's just some sort of like alchemy at play where, it, where if you like indulge in that counterphobic in, impulse, then something, you know, something sort of golden happens as a result. I, again, it's magic to me. Maybe this is just like vibes, but like, <laughs> But, but like I found that that is, it, you know, if a story can be organized around that, because it also forces me to go to certain places emotionally, and the characters that come out of that, the, the thematic weight that comes out of that, it doesn't feel like surface level engagement. Um, it feels like something deeper. And I think there's, that's also something that a reader can detect. Um, again, I'm not quite sure how that mechanism works, but like I, I just feel like it, it almost feels mystical. Um, but like that's how that's how a lot of that has been organized for me. It's just like writing into my fears. I mean, I still go to therapy, but like <laughs> it's no substitute for therapy. But like writing into my fears has helped. Yeah, I, I talk about on my podcast a lot, uh, blood on the page, like putting more blood on the page. There's times when I feel like what I've written is fine, but it's thin. And why would anyone, why would I expect a reader to spend hours and hours of their time reading this? So even in you know, a commercial genre fiction book, I want to make sure I'm putting enough of myself, the blood on the page, where I'm not necessarily like dying, but I, I, it, it's important and it's, it taps into something very real. And yeah, there is sort of a magical spiritual quality to it that you feel when you're writing. And to the point where I read this book back, I don't remember writing a lot of that. I don't remember, like, they were like, oh, I wrote that? <laughs> that came out of me? <laughs> Where'd that come from? <laughs> and you know, you get into that feeling. So it, it, vibes come in, even in my process, you know, like after I've plotted. Vibes are inescapable. Yeah, it's, what we're doing is, is like spirit work to a certain degree, whenever you're writing. Even if you're writing, you know, no matter what genre it is, I think to a certain degree, it has to come back to that. So I don't know if that answers your question, but. It does, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. <laughs> Um, oh, this person, like, hi, you want to go ahead? Oh, all right, go ahead. Uh, all right, go. All right, all right. Vibes, you know vibes. So. <laughs> okay, so my name is Mikhail Smith, and uh, it is such an honor to stand amongst you all. So I understand that I'm amongst avid readers. So with technology and social media platforms that are built towards deteriorating our attention span, how do you see the innovation and evolution of storytelling? Where do you go from here with, you know, you all's process, but how can we captivate new readers, new attention, where can we evolve the storytelling process? I don't think storytelling is going anywhere. I think storytelling is baked into humanity. It's part of what makes us humans. So, and storytelling comes in so many different ways. You know, they, people are innovating. There's, you know, Twitter fiction, there's micro fiction for these shorter attention spans. Um, and people are always afraid of the death of the novel, like when ebooks came or, Back when you know films in the early 1900s came, they're like, oh, we're, people are going to stop reading. They're watching these films and then television and the internet. So I don't think anything is going to take away reading. I mean, people, you know, the average American has only read one book a year or something like that, which is a very stat sad statistic for authors and lovers of fiction. So to that. I don't know if I have any like really good ideas about that, but I, I don't fear that we're going to stop reading and stop telling stories. You know, I think both of us are investigating other types of media, and that's something that we can do to continue telling our stories, maybe for you know, comic books or the screen or multimedia or whatever else comes about. We can still be storytellers, and there will still be people who love reading, even if it, that number decreases. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I mean, you know, they were talking about the death of the novel in like 19th century France, and it's like, what else were y'all doing? 
there was no there's no TV. You couldn't go to the movies. You certainly couldn't like pop The Last of Us Part One into your PS5 in 19th century France. So what? Where is the? Who's killing the novel? So. So yeah, so like that that conversation is always funny, but you know, it's exactly like Leslie said with other, with storytelling existing in other media. I mean, you know, I was joking about it earlier, but the you know, The Last of Us is my you know, it's one of the greatest like storytelling experiences I've I've engaged in in the past decade, like between part 1 and part 2. It's like I can't tell you how moved I was to experiencing that story. I mean, you know, I was mentioning graphic novels earlier. Like, that's a lot of what got me into the storytelling that I'm in today. Like, and they're long. Like, that's the that's the big part of it too. Like, Akira is two thousand plus pages, right? And I don't know that there was any book series like that I was reading like that, at least prose wise. But you put six volumes of Katsuhiro Otomo in front of me, in front of a lot of kids, really. Um, and that's, they're, they're off to the races. So I think that's part of it is just expanding what we think of in terms of storytelling. And I think that's going to allow for the multiplicity of pathways that can bring people to books who may not necessarily be there right now. Gotcha, thank y'all, yeah. thank y'all. Um, Hello. Uh -oh. Hi, my name is Danielle Robinson. Um, I'm a bookstagram and also part of a book club, Be To Weird book club that champions um, BIPOC authors. And we did tours actually for both your releases this year. Um, and I was just curious as avid readers, how do we continue to champion your work and uplift your work, but also hold the uh, publishing industry accountable to continue championing and uplifting um, stories by black authors in this science fiction and fantasy genre. Oh, <laughs> BT Word was amazing. Those videos, yeah, they just did the tour for my book. I just, I was so amazed. I loved all of the creativity and the book passing. And so thank you guys. Thank you so much. Um, and as, as bloggers and, you know, people who are helping, uh, more of that, I, I mean, publishing is an industry, they're looking at the bottom line, they're looking at the numbers. So however people can help promote, you know, to get people to buy the books, that's, that's the biggest thing that is going to shift the tide, seeing that these books can sell. And when I first started, and one of the reasons why I, I self-published before I went to tr traditional was because publishing wasn't where it is now. They didn't believe that these books could sell. They weren't publishing them. They weren't giving people a chance. And over the past 10 years, that has shifted a lot. You're seeing so much more because we've proven that black people buy books, queer people buy books about them and, and their experiences. And so word of mouth, promotion, whatever you can do to bring you know, to shine the light on these books that you want to see more of. If they get purchased more, they'll be published more. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, big ups to y'all for, for what you do. And like, you were going to, when you were, say, when you were, you know, prefacing your question, you were going to make me blush. Um, I think in terms of like what you can do, just like don't give up. Because I know like particularly for a lot of black booktubers and whatnot who don't get, who don't get the same like viewership numbers as a lot of their white compatriots, it can be very discouraging. Um, so like, but like the work that they do, the work that y'all do, like it matters, it, like y'all are making an impact. And so I guess that would be the only thing that I would say is like, don't, don't give up. Um, it means a lot, like what you, what Thank you do. You. Thank you. <laughs> um, we, this might be our last question, so please go ahead. Hi, my name is Jazz. Um, I had a question kind of talking about like the different time settings that your books are set in, one being in the future, one being in the past, but both of them resonate with readers of the present. And I kind of want to ask you guys, how do you think that um, like the beauty and like people in a present day being able to relate and take away a, um, a theme or something that will live with them for the rest of their lives, even though your books are set in two different time periods and settings that we will never really get to experience in our lifetimes. I think it's, it's characters and, and relatability. You know, um, they say in order to be more general, you should write very specifically. If you're writing about one person and what they care about, no matter what time it is, no matter who they are, you know, we can all relate to someone caring about a loved one, whether it's a sibling or even themselves, you know, a friendship, found family. There, there's certain things that you know, humans relate to. And so that's why it, it can be easy to sink into the pages of a novel and to a character's experience, even if the surroundings are very foreign. That you know, as a writer, I'm trying to bring a specific experience to life that can, even if you've never experienced it, you can connect with in some way. 
I haven't done the things my characters have done. So in order to write them, I'm trying to find that through line, that, that one thing, that emotion that we've both felt, that fear we've both felt, and, and have that grow and build on that. And so that's how I do it. Yeah, no, I just, just to piggyback very briefly, the specificity, absolutely. But I think everything that I write is about now. And I think ultimately every piece of genre fiction, no matter how far flung in the past or how slingshotted into the future, is about now. Um, just like fundamentally. And so I think that's part of why people are able to relate the way that they are with our stories. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank okay. you. And that, that concludes our panel. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs>